Anyways, friends, good morning and welcome to today's Tanya session. Very excited about today's Tanya session. Very, very profound, very, very powerful stuff. So, what we've been learning in the past two chapters is how we can sensitize ourselves to spirituality, how we can become inspired when we feel numb, when we feel, when we feel spiritually numb. And I'd like to elaborate on that for just a little bit. We spoke about the nuclear principle in the previous two chapters. We said that the key to sensitizing the godly soul is through disidentifying with the animal soul and realigning oneself with the godly soul. We said that as normal people that are not tzaddikim, as people that have not yet slaughtered, vanquished, subdued our animal souls, we identify more with our animal soul than we do with our godly soul. Our godly soul enters into us only, begins entering at the bris, and it finishes entering at the bar mitzvah. It's a late bloomer compared to the animal soul, which is, fi which, which is our identity even before we're born into this world. Therefore, the Alter Rebbe explained in chapter 29, two chapters ago, that when we crush ourselves, well, the principle, I'm sorry, the principle we explained was that a piece of wood, a log that doesn't catch fire, needs to be broken up into small pieces. If you have a log and it's not catching fire, then what you need to do is not to make more fire, you need to break it into smaller pieces. If you are the log and you're not feeling inspired, it's not that you need more, a greater rabbi, more Torah study, better sermons. What you need is to break yourself into smaller pieces. That's the principle of the Zohar. It's beautiful in Aramaic. A'o dele salik b'nehera de nishmasa mevachin le. A log that doesn't have the light of the soul shine within it, radiate within it, you've got to do something called bitush. Bitush is a very interesting word. It's a very powerful principle of Tanya. Bitush means to break yourself. You need to crush your ego. Because remember, the Tanya explains in chapter 29 that you and your animal soul are one. You and your ego are one. When you break yourself, you're breaking your ego. If you can break and crush yourself, you will be breaking your ego. By breaking your ego, you'll be breaking your log into small pieces, and therefore, the light of the soul will then be able to radiate within you. We spoke about this idea over the past couple weeks, how sometimes the bad things that happen to us need to be in, reinterpreted within the greater context. Instead of just saying, this is bad, why is God making something bad happen to me? Instead of looking at it within that context, we can, we can look at the greater picture and say, maybe something bad is happening to me in order to crush my ego so that the light of the soul will be able to shine within me so that I will literally be able to see the light. And we see this when people go through life crises, the loss of a loved one, loss of livelihood, and other life crises. We find them finding their faith. That's not because they're weak. It's not because they're vulnerable. It's because their log is crushed. And for the first time that they can remember, they are actually receptive to the light. As long as you are full of yourself, you won't be able to let the soul shine within you. 
It's a basic fundamental principle of, Zo- of Zohar, which is illuminated in Tanya. It's a basic principle of Chabad philosophy, that if you are dealing with students that are not receptive to you, you need to break them. You need to crush their egos. I remember when we were students back in Needs, England, we had a, a teacher who felt that we weren't being receptive enough. So out of for bringing late one night, he proceeded to explain to us how, <laughs> you know, how we shouldn't be so full of ourselves. And it was a very interesting process because by going into the details, he went through the process of out of for bringing. You know, he tried to do this bitush to crush our egos so that we'd be more receptive to the light. He wasn't crushing our egos because he was trying to be mean or nasty, but he was trying to let the light shine within us. It's a powerful principle. If you can't crush yourself from within, if you can't break your ego from within, then sometimes God will need to send us something from the outside to break our ego, like an enemy, like Hamas, like Hezbollah, like terrorism, like a war, like a coronavirus. God knows what he might send in order to allow the light to shine within us. I'm actually going to go off of YouTube entirely because it's totally not working, so I think it's slowing down our signal. Okay, back to Facebook. Tonight, today we're only on Facebook.com forward slash Jewish Gardens. Normally we are on YouTube.com forward slash Jewish Gardens. I think this video will later on be uploaded to YouTube.com forward slash Jewish Gardens, but for the meantime, we are here on um, Facebook alone. Welcome to Keith uh, and Miriam, to Harvey Barnett, to Adrian, to Vorachana, Lucy, Marty. Um, that's pretty much the crowd here. Nice to see everybody. So I'm building up to this idea, and I'd like to put things a little bit more into perspective. We accomplish, the Alter Rebbe explained that we accomplish the breaking of the ego, the breaking, the splintering of the log in order to allow the light to shine within us through confronting the ego of the animal soul and recognizing it as a blockage to our connection to God. That's what the Alter Rebbe said. I'm going to explain this in a moment. In addition to recognizing it as the, the blockage between us and God, we should actually shout at it so as to break its ego. We should literally rebuke it, have a chat with our, with our animal soul. In addition, one cannot think of oneself as inferior. Sorry. In addition, one can't think of others as inferior to oneself since their spiritual challenges are far greater than yours. That's what we learned in chapter 14. And it's all based on the Zohar doctrine of the splintered wood. Now, let's put things into perspective, practically speaking. The dysfunction within us is caused by our ego, a brilliant concept which the Alter Rebbe introduces us to. The dysfunction within us is caused by our ego. It's the dysfunction that doesn't allow us to be at peace with ourselves and hence prevents us from being at peace with other people, with our spouses, with our relationships, and also doesn't allow us to be at peace with our God as well. It's our ego which is the core of what is the defining essence of our animal So We explained way, way back in Tanya that the core of the animal soul is that it's self-centered. That's the essence of the animal soul. It's not evil. It's just self-centered as opposed to the godly soul, which is not self-centered. It is literally not of this world. Everything in this world is self-centered. The godly soul is literally out of this world. It is mission oriented it is god centered not self centered and that's the tug of war which we've learned about in tanya the in, inner conflict that we all experience between our self centered natural soul animal soul and the mission oriented godly soul this one wants you to go to shul even though you're tired this one wants you to stay in bed it's a tug of war this one wants to hold on to the money this one wants to give the money to charity it's this constant tug of war but the way the Alter Rebbe crystallizes this idea so beautifully, so profoundly, is that it is the ego which is the dysfunction within us and which is the, causes the breakdown of our relationships with others, with our spouses, with our children, with our parents, with our friends, and causes the dysfunction in our relationship with God as well. See, the ego allows us no rest. 
We, by definition, it prevents us from, have, from ever finding true love or ever, experience hap or ever experiencing true happiness because we're always seeking more by definition and we never have enough. When motivated by your ego, you can never have enough. Even when we feel loved, even when you're in a, you're going through a positive period in your relationship with your spouse, you're feeling love, you're feeling the magic. If you're being motivated by ego, it's part of a vicious cycle that will inevitably lead you to pain. So even though your relationship now is in a place of pleasure, you and your spouse, if motivated by ego, it's just a matter of time before you go through that vicious cycle and you end up in a painful part, in a painful place with your spouse. Because by its very definition, the ego can never have enough. It's insatiable. It's all about me and it's not about the other. It's all about what you can do for me. So right now you're doing for me and I feel good about it. But tomorrow you're not going to be doing enough for me. And tomorrow I'm going to feel rejected or abandoned or neglected or unappreciated or disrespected. And I will cry out in pain. So when driven by ego, all, the, all relationships eventually fall apart. The only way we can ever find peace of mind The only way we can ever find true love is by relinquishing the ego. Now, this is unthinkably painful. For us to relinquish our ego is, is, is something which we, we can't even fathom, we can't even process. Because we are our ego. We are our evil, sorry, we are our natural soul. That's what the Altar Rebbe said in chapter 29. He said, we are our natural soul. Our godly soul is the guest soul within us. We say every morning, soon after we wake up, my God, the soul which you have put within me is pure. We refer to the godly soul as the guest soul within us what is already me, because my animal soul defines me, my ego defines me. What do you mean, Rabbi? So that I can divest of my ego. I can't, that is who I am. If I let go of my ego, it means that I let go of myself. I can't do that. The reason is because why can't we miss? Why can't we disidentify with our ego? Is because we truly identify with our ego. It defines us. Letting go of our ego would mean, according to the Alter Rebbe, letting go of our ego would mean to letting go of ourselves, letting go of everything we know about ourselves. We simply can't do that, and that's why most people live their lives in a state of dysfunction. They are constantly unhappy. You see, children don't have this problem. Your typical child is walking around with a big smile on his or her face. They have no problems, no stress. They're just happy. Why are they happy? Because there's no ego. The same child that can walk around carelessly, carefree, totally disrobed, with no sense of shame, with no sense of ego, that's why they're happy. It's only as we mature, as we become older, as we sense a sense of shame, as we realize mine and possession and yours, as our sense of ego is magnified, suddenly we become all serious. Is that progression? Or is that maybe regression? That's why I often say that the child who is sad, you ask him what's wrong. But when you see an adult who's smiling ear to ear, you say, what's wrong with you, man? What are you smoking? The default setting of a child is to be happy. The default setting of an adult 
is to be serious or miserable. If he's smiling like this, you say, what's wrong with you? The reason is because the child doesn't have an ego. It hasn't kicked in yet. The child's sense of self-awareness just isn't there because he's, she's not mature enough yet. It's when we grow older that suddenly we become more serious. The dysfunction kicks in as soon as our ego kicks in. And that's why most people live their lives in a state of dysfunction, in a state of unhappiness. Troubled relationships, certainly dysfunctional relationship with God, and dysfunctional relationship with themselves where they don't really know what they want. And we're constantly looking to fill that void with another vacation, with another hobby, with another toy, with another car, with another house, with another distraction, with another movie, with another marriage, with another relationship. We're constantly looking for anesthetics to anesthetize our pain, never truly having the courage to address the problem at its core. Because the core is our identification of self with our natural soul, with our animal soul, with our ego. As long as we're identified with ego, we will never be happy by definition because we always want more. But the Alter Rebbe takes us by the hand. He puts his arm over our shoulder and he says, let me help you. I can help you pick yourself up to a higher state of being where you don't need to identify with your animal soul because there's something else that you can identify with. And that's what the Alter Rebbe tells us, that we can step out of our identification with our ego. We can step out of ourselves the way we know ourselves. We can observe ourselves from a higher vantage point. We can step into a higher consciousness. And from there we can see the Alter Rebbe shows us in Tanya that we don't actually need to identify with the dysfunction. We don't need to identify with our insatiable ego. There's a principle in Talmud, Ein chavush mati a prisoner cannot redeem himself. If you're stuck in a dungeon, you can't get out by yourself. You need someone else to throw you a line to get you out. If you're stuck at the bottom of a, of a pit, you can't get out. You need someone to throw you a rope to pull you out. Here the Alter Rebbe tells us, look, we're all prisoners. Every single one of us was created as a prisoner. We're stuck within our own dysfunction. Within, we're prisoners to our own ego. And we cannot break free. We simply cannot break free. But the Alter Rebbe is that person who's walking around, you know, we're stuck at the bottom of the pit. And the Alter Rebbe is at the top of the pit and he hears our cries. And he throws us the rope and he says, here, let me help you out. And that's the path that we're learning in chap the chapters 29 and 30 and now 31 of Tanya, which are going to help us get out of this pit. You know, just answer your question, Terry. Are you saying that the ego is different from the animal soul? No, I'm not. I'm saying that the ego is the definition, it is the defining character of the animal soul. What is an animal? What's an animal? An animal is a beautiful creature that was created to be self-serving. It eats to sustain itself. It sleeps and procreates and drinks and hunts in order to sustain itself. It's all self-serving. There's nothing wrong with that. It has the survival instinct which is self-serving. It is only the godly soul which is literally not of this world. It's unique to the Jewish people, actually. Tanya chapter 2 tells us that the godly soul is unique to the Jewish people. It's literally not of this world. When someone converts to Judaism, they'll receive that extra soul. That godly soul is a soul which is not self-centered. <laughs> it's almost like unthinkable. It's something which is so hard for us to even relate to. Obviously, everything in this world is self-serving. Do you know anyone in this world that's not self-centered? Seriously, do you know anybody that's not self-centered? that doesn't have an ulterior motive, they would rather pay his friend's mortgage than pay his own mortgage. I mean, it doesn't even make sense. 
The Alter Rebbe gives us this earth-shattering revelation in Tanya chapter 2 when he says that we have another soul. We have a godly soul stuffed inside of us. It's a late bloomer. It's a guest within our being, within our animal soul, which rules the roost. But this godly soul is also there. And if we can only have a chiropractic adjustment, to have the courage to take that bungee jump, you know what it's like when you, t when you bungee jump? I cannot imagine because I you couldn't pay me enough money to jump off a bridge with a string attached to my feet. I happen to be terrified of heights, and there's no way in the world that I would ever do that jump. Somehow when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, we used to go to the, to the beautiful uh, nature reserves of South Africa. We used to do something called rock jumping. I must have been peer pressure that caused me to do this because I'm terrified of heights. We used to go to these rocks, boulders that were 30, 40 feet up above the water, and we used to jump off the, off the rocks to get into, you know, to jump into these beautiful natural pools. And I remember telling myself that the hardest part was getting into the air. Once you're in the air, it's all downhill from there. <laughs> it actually worked for me. It was pretty good. So I just used to have to force myself to get into the air, then I was good. We've got to be able to get out off of terra firma, to get off of the earth, to launch ourselves into foreign territory. And that's what the Altarab is telling us. Let go of the ego. Let go of your natural soul. Let go of your animal soul. And I will show you, says the Altarab in Tanya chapter 29, I'll show you how you can re-identify with the light within you, with the higher consciousness within you, something which is not self-serving, something which is not self-centered in essence. We'll get to that in a moment. Just to answer your question, Andy. Oh, I see Michael Horowitz is with us too. Lovely. Nice to see you, Michael. Just to answer your question, Andy. Humiliating students is a good way to teach. I know it sounds counterintuitive, Andy. I know. But this is exactly the principle that the Alter Rebbe is laying down to us in Tanya chapter 29. It's not from the Alter Rebbe. It's from the Zohar. It's Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. The author of the Kabbalah, the one who wrote down the secrets of Moses on Mount Sinai that he received from God. It was the Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai from Lagba Omer, who passed away as Yerzad is in Lagba Omer. He wrote this down. That a log that doesn't catch fire, you need to take this log and smash it to splinters, and only then will it catch a light. When you are apathetic to inspiration, to godliness, to holiness, if you're struggling in your marriage, if you don't feel in love in your relationship with your spouse, you're too full of yourself. That's what the Alter Rebbe is telling us. That's what the Zohar is telling us. Not you, Andy. You, as in all of us. If you're not feeling the love in your relationship, it's because your ego is stuffing you up. You need to be broken. It's when you go through a life crisis... It's when your ego is shattered, when you come back with your tail between your legs, that that's when you are able to be more receptive to the love of the relationship. But if you're so full of your ego, you can't. When we were students back in the yeshiva in Leeds, we were, you know, graduates of the academy. We were elite students, maybe. It was the wisdom of our rabbi, of our mashpia, the, the, the yeshiva mentor, who understood this principle of Tanya. And he needed to, didn't, he didn't have to humiliate all the students, he had to take one or two choice students. And he had to, you know, just break our ego, not in order to humiliate and break us for the sake of breaking us, but for the sake of letting the, sh the light shine within. I think it was Leonard Cohen who wrote, no, was it Leonard Cohen who wrote a song, Anthem? I think it was a maybe anthem. Something about the crack is where the light comes in. Where you get broken. You know, he's, his songs were very dark. He went through many struggles in his own spiritual journeys. But it's the crack, which is which, where the light gets in. Being broken is not necessarily a bad thing. Maybe you were impervious to the light. I believe that what Leonard Cohen is talking about is a Tanya principle. I believe the principle that he's talking about is that when you become broken, that's when your light 
is able to shine because you're living in a dark cell. There's no sunlight. When you take an axe and you smash through the wall, you're like, oh, now we got some air. I can breathe. Just before I get to the comments, I see they're coming in. Whoa, a lot of comments. Ooh, wow. um, just before I get to the comments, I just want to say one thing. You know, the Alter Rebbe says in Tanya chapter 31 today, he says that when Moses was leading the Jewish people out of Egypt, he does something amazing. He just crippled the mighty Egyptian empire. He just brought the world's superpower to her knees. Egypt was the United States of America of 3,300 years ago. This is the most powerful military, the most powerful economy in the world. And the nation of slaves within her has brought 10 devastating, crippling plagues upon Egypt. Moses could have asked for anything. He could have asked for the Brooklyn Bridge and they would have given it to him. I mean, it wasn't like he was negotiating with Pharaoh. He was teaching Pharaoh lesson after lesson after lesson. But yet, when it comes to the 10th, plague, the, 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 um, pl the death of the firstborn. Pharaoh is literally shaking in his pajamas. It's the middle of the night and Pharaoh is afraid of dying because he is the firstborn. And he says, what do you want? Just get out of here already. And Moses says, we just want three days vacation. Three days furlough. That's all we're asking for. We'll come back. And now for Mo and Pharaoh's like, okay, just go. And the Jews go. And after three days, they don't come back. And Pharaoh wakes up and he realizes, oy vey. They're not coming back. They lied to me. So the Egyptian army chases the Jews. They meet, them, meet up with them in the Red Sea. And we all know the rest of the story. The Red Sea split. The Egyptians drown. The Jews emerge on the other side. And we celebrate L'chaim on Passover ever since. Why did Moses need to ask for three days? Why did he have to deceive Pharaoh? Why couldn't he say, we're leaving Egypt for good. We're never going to see you ever again. Why did, why did Moses need to, need to play games? Why did he need to lie to Pharaoh? And that's the principle that Tanya chapter 31 explains to us today. The author of explains that the story of the Exodus from Egypt isn't merely an ancient historical episode. It's the story of our souls. When we eat the matzah and the bitter herbs in Pesach, we're not just remembering what our ancient ancestors did. We're living our own stories. Pharaoh is the high and mighty one. Pharaoh is the one who is our taskmaster that we cannot escape. Pharaoh is our ego. Egypt, the word Egypt in Hebrew, Mitzrayim, means limitations, boundaries, shackles, Prison. Don't read, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. Say, we are slaves to our ego in our addictions. We are addicted to our ego. We cannot let go. Think about it. Can you let go of your ego right now? I'm going to get to the questions in a moment. I'm so sorry. I see them coming in fast and furious. Um, if you just tuned in, we're, we're learning Tanya today. Tuesday Tanya. We're learning Tuesday Tanya. We're learning Jewish philosophy. We're learning about how to deal with your, um, your inability to get inspired. If you're not feeling the light in your relationship, in your marriage, if you're not feeling the love in your relationship with God, you just don't feel inspired. When you were a kid, you used to get inspired. Pesach, Sukkot, Rosh Hashanah was exciting. Now you're not getting inspired. Why? The Altar Rebbe teaches us today in Tanya that if the log of wood, the thick log doesn't catch fire, you need to break it. You need to smash it into small pieces. You are the log. Your ego needs to be broken. When you break your ego, that's when you become free. The message that the Alter Rebbe tells us today in Tanya is that Moses escaping from Pharaoh is you and me escaping from our ego. We can't just tell our ego, goodbye, it was nice knowing you, I'm never going to see you again. You and I cannot do that.
Because our ego is me. Your ego, ego is you. You cannot just escape from your ego. We are tied to our ego with strong bonds. Moses has to say to Pharaoh, we are running away from you. Give me three days. He has to deceive Pharaoh to get away from the ego. And then he's going to run like his life depends on it, even though if Moses was seemingly in a position of authority over Pharaoh after the ten devastating plagues, he still couldn't get away from Pharaoh because for you and I to get away from our ego is almost unthinkable, but it's doable. That's what the Tanya is telling us. If you're in a, in, a, in a difficult marriage, and we all struggle in our relationships, relationships take work, they take humility, they take courage, they take wisdom. If you're trying to improve your relationship, the Altarab is telling us you've got to divest of the ego, and that's not going to come easy, but we're going to, he's going to walk us through the process in just a few moments. The first thing we learn is that when Moses tried to get away from Pharaoh, when Moses is getting away from his ego, that's the metaphor for you and I getting away from our ego, it doesn't go to cold turkey. You can't just go cold turkey and say, I'm done with my ego, I'm moving on with my life. You can't. You've got to deceive your ego. You've got to run away, and it's going to be something that's going to take the rest of your life as you run away from ego, from your, your ego, as you try to identify with a higher consciousness, with a higher sense of being, with the light of your godly soul. We'll get to that in a moment. Let's take a look at the comments coming in. Everybody needs an ego, some sort of ego, to have any confidence in him or herself. This, Ed, is where I disagree with you. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going in. I should go the other way around. I'm sorry, I'm going to go the other way around. I'm going to start with the comments at the bottom, the most recent comments, and I'm going to go back. So I'm starting at the very bottom right now, okay? So, Robert, do you think Moses told Pharaoh to get his knee off the necks of the Jewish people? Do you think Moses told Pharaoh to get his knee off the necks of the Jewish people. Absolutely. Absolutely, Rob. The Jewish people are being persecuted, just like the blacks today. Unfortunately, the, this uh, attack in, um, of George, of the murder, I'm sorry, of George Floyd was unexcusable, it was abominable, it was obnoxious, it's frightening when you think of the abuse of power of the police force and the justice needs to be executed in, um, in this horrific case. And we absolutely need to cure ourselves from prejudice of any kind. It is completely unacceptable to experience any prejudice, any, any um, hatred of any other minority, of any other people. It is not the Jewish way. We're actually looking forward to having some black Jews join us, hopefully very soon. We're working on some, uh, some programs with them to make things happen. But yes, I think that Moses told Pharaoh to get his knee off the necks of the Jewish people just to put things in the context of, of uh, today's, uh, what's happening today. Hi, Dan, and hi, Yosef. Uh, it was a rhetorical question. You were stuck in need to had to deal with smashing the students. I'm not a fan of the technique. Andy, look, I want you to know that what the Altarab is telling us about, um, about letting your log catch light, he says to us in Tanya that there's no other way. You have no other way to divest of your ego other than to confront it. And you're going to have to have the courage to face the monster within you, to face the Pharaoh within you, to get his neck, his knee off of your neck. If you're going to experience happiness and freedom. That's what the author is telling us. I challenge you, Andy, to tell me another way to do this. Because I don't believe that there is. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. A lot of sleepless nights. I'm serious, not thinking about this, including last night. Um, Terry, hi. Michael, hi. Um, okay, Dvorah So Gentiles don't have a godly soul or Jews have something extra? Uh, the answer is both, Dvorah the, the Everybody has an animal soul. Everybody has a natural soul. Everybody. Jews have an extra soul. It's a godly soul. That's the tiny chapter 2 tells us. Um, 
it is literally not of this world. It's a soul which is not self-serving. It's a soul which is oriented around God, right? Hence the term chosen people. When God chose us, he put within us a piece of himself. What are you going to do to anybody else? So we have, a, we have this split personality. We've got this, this um, dual loyalty, a loyalty to this world and a loyalty to God. And we're constantly in, in struggle. Yes, that's Tanya chapter 2. Graciela, yes, I got confused with that too. Um, Terry, that's what I thought. But did, Terry says, that's what I thought. But didn't you say a child only has an animal soul until its godly soul comes in at bar mitzvah? So then why would a child always be happy? Because the child has the animal soul, but the child doesn't have a state of a sense of consciousness. The child is not aware of his animal soul until he gets older. Right? The child is just living in the moment. The child is just present. The child doesn't worry about tomorrow. The child doesn't worry about yesterday until he gets a little older when his brain develops a little bit and he becomes conscious of the now, past, present, and future. That's when the animal soul, the, the ego kicks in. But until, they, until they're thinking beyond this present moment, of course, they have their, their natural soul, but they're not, they're not obsessed with a sense of the ego. They're just in the moment. It's only when they mature a little older and they start thinking more, that's when, they, when the ego kicks in. They're only happy if its needs are met. Okay, good. And uh, to add, I want to say everyone needs an ego, some sort of ego to have any confidence in him or herself. This is exactly the point that I disagree with you. And yes, I know that you're having a hard time divesting of your ego. That's exactly what I said. That it's going to be very, very difficult to divest of your ego because we feel like we're jumping off a rock like I was when I was a teenager. Jumping off a rock to land into a pool. I don't know what's down there. It's a terrifying experience. So what are we going to be identifying with? Where are we going to get a sense of identification? That's exactly where the Alter Rebbe is going to take us. He's taking us to a happy place. That's where we're going. Terry, thank you. That's helpful. Dvorahana, aren't all human beings made from a part of God? Uh, yes and no. I mean, there's different degrees of that, Dvorahana. Again, this is Tanya chapter 2. It's something from the very beginning of Tanya, that uh, everything in this world is made by creation of God, but it works like this. So whereas God speaks everything into existence, Everything is spoken into existence by God. The, the Jewish soul is blown into us. It, God blew the soul, in, uh, the godly soul into Adam, right? So how much energy do you invest into your speech versus, versus how much energy do you invest when you blow? You can speak all day long without getting tired, but you can't blow all day long. You can only blow for a few seconds and then you get tired. Right? You blow from your kishkis. Your essence is being invested when you blow. So when God blew the godly soul into us, it's his essence that's in inserted into us. But when God speaks us into existence, it's only a small little uh, level of godliness that goes into all of creation and everybody else. That Hopefully that answers your question. Anyways, let's go back to this profound concept of re-identification re of self in order to find a state, to, to relinquish ourselves, to free ourselves from our state of dysfunction. So what the Altarab explains to us in Tanya chapter 29, and, I, and I'm not sure if I'm going to have time to go into chapter 31 today, because I'm trying to put things into perspective. Today what I'm trying to do is to go through the Chachma Bina Da'at process. Chachma is the idea, understanding is Bina, and Da'at is the realization, is the personal application. Is after we've We've understood the idea. We're now going to feel the idea. That's what I'm really doing today, is to try to put what we've learned so far into personal perspective. So instead of talking about our relationship with God, I'd like to talk today about our relationship with our lovers, with our spouses. I'd like to talk about our relationship with ourselves and how we learned in Tanya that our ego is a, a, stumbling, a stumbling block, an obstacle in our relationship with God. But what about our ego being a stumbling block in our relationship with our, with our spouses, our ego being a stumbling block with our, in our relationship with ourselves? That's what I'm, how I'm putting this, this Tanya into personal perspective. So if we step... So, so what the Alter Rebbe tells us is that our ego is actually an imposter. In this brilliant, brilliant idea, the Yalt Rebbe tells us that our ego is not who we truly are. It's an alien, an alien identity that was introduced to us through the serpent in the Garden of Eden. If you remember that story, I'm not going to get too much into it, but in the story of the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were pure. They were holy. They were selfless in the Garden of Eden. I want you to think about this for a moment. Adam and Eve were walking around in the Garden of Eden naked. They had no sense of shame. They had no sense of ego. The Medrash tells us that Adam and Eve were procreating in plain sight in the Garden of Eden because there was no sense of shame. They were walking around stark naked. 
The snake was the embodiment of evil, of ego in the world. And the, and the snake wanted to exist. So what the snake did was, is that it convinced Adam and Eve to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's the one tree they were not allowed to eat from. What does it mean, knowledge of good and evil? The word knowledge is that. The, 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 the tree of intimate knowledge. The tree of intimate connection with good and evil. So up until that moment, good and evil were distinct and separate the snake, was, the serpent, was the embodiment of ego, and everything else had no ego within it. Adam and Eve could walk around naked with no sense of shame or self-awareness, no sense of ego. But once they ate from the tree of knowledge, of intimate knowledge of good and evil, they, were now, they had now ingested ego. Ego now had become a part and parcel of Adam and Eve, of the human consciousness. That's why, what was the first thing that Adam and Eve did after they ate from the tree of knowledge? Think about it, friends. What was it? What was the very first thing that Adam and Eve did after they ate, after they ate from the tree of knowledge? Do you remember? The first thing that they did is that they covered their, naked, their nakedness. They suddenly realized that they were naked. How did they realize that they were naked? Because they said, oh! They suddenly realized Self, self-awareness was suddenly introduced to this world. And because self-awareness was introduced to the, to the world, therefore Adam and Eve needed to experience mortality. That's why they needed to die. See, as long as they were separate from ego, they could be immortal. But the moment they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the moment ego became a part and parcel of their identity, God did not want to allow ego to have an immortal existence. Therefore, God introduced mortality, death to this world, so that ego will die. When Mashiach will come, we will have successfully divested ourselves from our ego. We will have repaired the damage done by Adam and Eve to have raised ourselves to a state of higher consciousness like we're learning about today so that we will have successfully separated ourselves from our ego and therefore we will be able to become immortal again with the era of Mashiach because no longer will ego be a part of our consciousness. We will have raised ourselves up to a state of higher presence, of higher being, of re-identification of self by choice from our animal soul, from our natural soul, from our ego to our, sense, to our, to our godly soul, to, our, to the light within us. So, our ego is actually an imposter, introduced to us only through the sin of the Garden of Eden. But it's not who we truly are. We've got to get rid of this. We've got to get over this. And the way the Altarab explains it is that ego is actually a shadow that covers over the light within us. Just like a shadow cannot exist without a light somewhere, the shadow is the, is, is the dark part of the light. A shadow cannot exist without a light. You turn the light off, there's no shadow. The shadow is the dark part of the light. The purpose of the ego is to hide, oh, is to hide our true selfless core. But it's a shadow that depends on the light in order to exist. Just like a lie has no cannot exist on its own. A lie needs a kernel of truth in order to endure. It's a Torah principle. If you want a lie to endure, you've got to say something true. When the spies returned with a negative report about Israel, the land of Israel in the Torah, they made sure to insert one true point about the land of Israel so that the rest of what they were saying would endure. Because if you say a lie which is totally has no basis of truth, it will fall apart. It's only when the lie has a kernel of truth will it endure, so too the ego cannot exist without the light from which it derives its identity. The very light which ironically it cannibalizes. Just like a virus. A virus cannot exist on its own. It needs to sabotage the host 
it eats in the proteins, it feeds off the proteins of the host that gives its life, that which it sabotages. So the virus makes sick the host that sustains it. The virus literally bites the hand that feeds it. That's what the ego does. The ego is sustained by the light of our soul. It cannot exist without it. And its mission is to cover up over our soul. To make us feel that we need to identify, just like you said, Ed, to make us feel that we need to identify with our ego, that, to make us feel helpless, like we cannot let go, we cannot divest of our ego. It sort of moves into us and makes us feel like we, like it is who we are. But ironically, it's only sustained by the very light that it comes to hide. The ego cannot bear the thought of being exposed, just like a shadow would disappear if you shone the light upon it. If exposed for its true identity, like a light shining on a shadow, it would disappear. Hence, the Alta Rebbe tells us in chapter 29, our mere ability to have the courage to confront our ego face to face is what neutralizes it. That's when the Alta Rebbe told us the analogy of the hired whore. The hired whore. The analogy again from the Zohar, the book of Kabbalah, was that the whore, the prostitute, was hired by the king in order to seduce the prince. It is one big test. If the prince looks the whore in the eye and says to her, I know you're trying to seduce me, but I know that this is all fake. I know it's all a test, so go. It's very hard for me to overcome temptation, but I know that this is a test. I know that this is fake. I know my father is testing me right now. I know that my father is watching me through that camera over there. Therefore, I'm not going to fall into your seduction. If the prince has the courage, has the wisdom to say that to the hired whore, he won't fail in his test. And that is what the Alta Rebbe tells us, is how we have to face our ego. We have to look at our ego and say, look, I know who you are. I know that you're causing all this unhappiness within me. You're causing me to be unhappy with myself, to, to be, have an insatiable appetite. I, I'm never going to be happy if, I, if I'm centered around my ego. I'll never, ever have enough. If I have 100, I want 200. If I have 200, I want 400. Do you know anybody who has enough money? Seriously, do you know any human being in this world that has enough money? I've never met such a person. Every single person that I know, However much they have, they want more. Even if they were raised poor, if they have $10 million today, they want $20 million. Like, why not? I don't know any human being that, 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 doesn't, that, that has enough of anything. That's because we're identified with our ego. Because we don't have enough, we always need more. Our pursuit of happiness is futile. That's why it's called life liberty and the pursuit of happiness because happiness is a mirage you will never ever ever reach happiness you can reach life you can reach liberty but you will never reach happiness by definition if you identify with your ego the altar is telling us to look our ego in the eye to shine a light upon the shadow to unveil the mask, the disguise of the prostitute to say, I know who you are. I know who you work for. You work for my father. This is a test. I'm being watched right now. I will not fail this test. I will pass. When you're able to have the courage to confront your ego, you are shining a light upon the darkness, upon the shadow. And that, by definition, says the Alter Rebbe, is what neutralizes the ego. And that's why, Andy, to your point, it's the smashing of the wood that allows it to catch a light. It's the humbling, it's the humiliating, the humbling, what, I'm not sure what the word is here, the, it's the breaking of the ego of your students that will allow them to become more receptive. Do you remember that story I mentioned a few weeks ago? I just want to say it again because it was so important. Rabbi Yeshua was riding along the way and he met a person and he said to him, my, oh my, how ugly you are. It's an unbelievable story. How can a rabbi say this to someone? I cannot believe how ugly you are. 
To which the man responds, don't tell me how ugly I, I am. Tell it to the craftsman who made me. Tell it to God. And Rabbi Yeshua had fulfilled his purpose. Because this man wasn't physically ugly. This man was spiritually ugly. He was so dripping and oozing and flowing with ego that there was nobody home. He was one fat log. And it was only by taking an act and smashing his ego, by saying to him, you're so despicable, that Rabbi Yeshua gave him a patch like the man never experienced before. And that actually allowed the light to shine within him. He said, don't tell me, tell my, my, my maker. Oh, wow, you're talking about God? You actually realize that there is a maker? I fulfilled my mission. I know it, it's, not, uh, it's not popular, Andy, but this is what the Alter Rebbe is telling us. If you're going to divest of your ego, you're going to have to have the courage to understand how your ego works. It's like a cancer that's going to overtake you unless you look it in the eye and stop it from spreading. You've got to blow its cover. You've got to shout at it. You've got to belittle it. That's what the Alter Rebbe said, two things in 29. He said you've got to recognize it for who it is as your problem. You have to recognize that your ego is the cause of all your dysfunction within your own happiness and within your relationships with others and your relationship with God. And then the Alter Rebbe said you also have to shout at it. Just like Moses shouted at the Jewish people, the spies that didn't want to enter the promised land, the Jewish people that refused to enter the promised land because of the report of the spies. And it was as a result of his shouting at the, at the Jewish people that they suddenly had a change of heart and they said, okay, we'll go. Well, what suddenly happened? Five minutes ago, you said that it was inconquerable. Now suddenly it became conquerable. It's because they were overcome by ego. It was when Moses smashed their ego by saying to them, you guys are going to die in this desert. It's your children that will enter the promised land. By breaking their ego, by scaring them, that's when they, their ego was broken and their light was able to shine within them. It is caused, so the ego has caused all the misery in our relationships. If we can let go of it, Without it, we could have felt loved and embraced unconditionally without feeling inadequate and suspicious about our relationships. Think about it. Think about all the dysfunction in your, in your marriage. Think about it for a moment. If you could crystallize the dysfunction in your marriage, I believe that it boils down, unless there's other, other issues, which is possible, but in a healthy marriage, the dysfunction typically is brought about by an obsession with self. You're too obsessed with yourself about what, what she needs to do to me, how needs, she needs to treat me, how she needs to talk to me. If you stop thinking about yourself, it could have, would have, and should have. If you let go of yourself, you'll be much, much happier. When you let go of your ego, you're left with the light of the, sh of the soul shining unobstructed, unconcealed, without any shadows. And if you can just recognize the damage that your ego has done to your relationships, it's that mere recognition itself that the Alter Rebbe tells us which will allow us to divest of our ego and cause us to shout at our ego and say, no, get out of here. I don't want you in my life. You're destroying my life. This is the metaphor to your relationship with God as well. And that's what the Alter Rebbe is talking about in Tanya 29. This is the paradigm shift, my friends. And again, we didn't have time to get into chapter 31 today. We just touched on one point in the chapter. But I think it was well worth the time to put things into perspective, into this game-changing concept that the Alter Rebbe is introducing to us in Tanya's chapters 29 and 30. That the ego is the source of all dysfunction within our lives. We have to have the courage to let go of that ego. The way we let go of that ego is by understanding the nature of our ego, by understanding the metaphor of the hired whore. The ego is merely a, a mirage. The solution is realigning ourselves from our God, from our animal soul, which is driven by ego, and realigning ourselves with our godly soul, which has no ego, it's mission-oriented. You know, I just want to conclude with this thought here by saying that whew, there was a story of a chassid in, in, in uh, Russia who was sent to the Siberian Gulag. His name was Remendel Futurfas. He was sent to the Siberian Gulag for the crime of teaching Judaism or something. And there he was with other political dissidents and enemies of the, of the state. And they were all miserable. Professors, doctors, lawyers, scientists, they were all miserable. And he was walking around happy. And they said to him, Remendel, how is it that you are the only one here who's happy? Everybody else is miserable. How come you're, you're, you're the one, only one who's happy? And he said to them like this, look, you're a professor from St. Petersburg. 
You're a scientist, you're a doctor, you're a lawyer. Without your tools, without your universities, without your students, you're nothing. You're not a professor, you're not a scientist. You're here in the Siberian Gulag chopping wood and, uh, and shoveling snow all day long. You're not a professor, you're not a doctor, you're not a lawyer. But for me, I'm a Jew. I identify with my godly soul. Wherever I am is where I need to be. I serve God anywhere and everywhere. Yesterday, I was, I was, uh, last year I was a Jew in, in Moscow. Today I'm a Jew in the, the frozen wastelands of Siberia. It makes no difference to me where I am. Anywhere that I am, I'm serving God. Because Reb Mendel identified with his godly soul. You see, imagine this Jew was identifying with his animal soul. Should have been me, me, me. I deserve. I should be this. I should be getting that. I'm angry with God for sending me to the Gulag. I'm angry with Stalin for sending me to the Gulag. I'm angry with the world. I'm angry with my parents. I'm angry with so many things and entities. But when Reb Mendel was able to realign his identity from his ego, from his natural soul, to realign to his godly soul, he was able to say, look, it's not about me. It's about the mission. And if I'm here, then this means this is my mission. I'm happy. It's, when you're identifying with your ego, you never have enough. When you're identifying with your godly soul, wherever you are is where you need to be. The ego always thinks about what, you, what he doesn't have. The light always thinks about where he is and what he has. And he's grateful for it. The ego is obsessed with the past and the future, grandiose plans, Guilt over the past, anxiety over the future, plans for greatness. The ego is always living in the past and in the future. But the godly soul is just here, right now, this moment. This is where I am. This is all I need. I have everything I need because this is where God put me. This is my mission right here. I'm not worried about what's going to be tomorrow, where I'm going to be. Who cares? Wherever I'll be, that's where God wants me to be. The godly, sorry, the animal soul, the ego is obsessed with results. But the godly soul focuses not on results, but on effort. Today I'm going to do my best, and that's it. I'm going to give it all I've got. I'm not obsessed with the results that I reach my goals, that I not reach my goals. It's not about me. It's about me trying today at this moment. That's all that matters. Wherever he is, the godly soul finds purpose and happiness and meaning. But the, God, the animal soul, the ego, is always frustrated, never having enough. This, my friends, is um, chapters 29 and 30 of Tanya, just put into new perspective. I hope that you can relate to the dysfunction within ourselves, the ego. That yes, we can let go of this ego because there's not one of us, there's two of us. There's two identities inside of you. And it's your choice which one you want to identify with. Do you want to identify with your ego, with your dysfunctional natural soul? Or do you want to identify with the light within you, the beauty within you? Think about how you will never be happy as long as you're driven by your ego. It's the definition of insanity, thinking that I'm going to try, new, try the same thing over again and, gonna get, and I'm going to get different results. I've never found happiness. I've never found serenity and peace when I was driven by my ego. I never reached the point that I said, that I said ah, now I'm happy. Think about it. Whenever you reach your goals, you're happy for five seconds or five minutes, and then you're unhappy all over again because you've got a new goal, a new horizon, a new mountain to climb. The ego is never satisfied. Not with itself and not with its marriage. If you want a happy marriage, if you want a happy relationship with yourself, you've got to let go of that ego and let the light shine inside of you. Break your log. Smash it into small pieces. Break your ego. Let the light shine within you. That is the light of your godly soul. Cast away the shadows that are suffocating, that are, that are blinding your light. The toxic fumes that are suffocating your oxygen. Enter into the now. Enter into higher consciousness. Thank you very much, everybody. It's been a pleasure. Charlotte, good morning. No YouTube, I'm sorry. Um, it wasn't working today for some reason. But uh, if you have any questions, comments, we'd love to hear from you. Please send me an email to rabbi at jewishgardens.com. That's rabbi at jewishgardens.com. We'd love to hear from your thoughts, comments, feedback. And with that, I'm signing off. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining me today.